Hello. Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage. Well, this is one of a series of films in which I'm going to take you behind the scenes of some of the shows, functions, and famous events that are staged throughout the year, and let you see some of the interesting work of the men and women who make them possible. Well, our stage is set, so let's ring up the curtain and go behind the scenes with our camera. The famous Science Museum in South Kensington was opened in 1896. Every day through its doors come children, decades of children, children of all ages. In the radio section, this complicated working model of a mercury valve rectifier is an open book to the scientific children of today. But the museum caters to all scientific tastes. And not only scientific tastes either. These dioramas, as they're called, are works of art of an unusual kind. Part painting, part sculpturing, and part modeling, they have the fascination of all three. We went behind the scenes to see how they're made. One of the foremost artists in this field is Mr. R.T. Roussel. This model, which Mr. Roussel is making for the Royal Scottish Museum, Edinburgh, is one of the Egyptian high priest Ai, who was both Tutankhamun's tutor and his successor. The figures are modeled in plasticine on a skeleton of soft wire. Mr. Roussel finds sticks of solder as good as anything since they bend freely without breaking. When the plasticine figures are completed, they're cast in more enduring plaster so that none of the delicate molding or detail will be lost. All these dioramas are designed to be seen from a man's average height of 5 feet 7 inches. Both the figures and the background are slightly distorted so that the perspective will be correct when the models are viewed in their place in the museums. This final placing is very important, and Mr. Roussel often visits museums where his work is exhibited to check whether the lighting of the museum is satisfactory in relation to the position of his exhibit. This is a model of Murdoch's retort of 1803, one of the earliest developments in the manufacture of gas. The model itself is illuminated internally, but it's been placed in the museum in such a position that the outside lighting impinges on it, so Mr. Roussel is painting out an incorrect shadow which is cast by this outside lighting. This model is to take its place in the Science Museum's gas gallery. This is a recent addition to the museum's unique record of man's ingenuity and achievements. The behind-the-scenes work on the many scale and working models displayed here, and the artistic beauty of Mr. Roussel's dioramas, like this one of the discovery of that vital flame gas, make the new gas gallery well worth a visit. There's usually quite a crowd here all day, many having a sandwich lunch. Personally, I prefer my snacks on these new cracker fingers. They're really a kind of biscuit, which with butter becomes waterproof and stays crisp, even though you have to prepare the snacks quite a long time before the guests arrive. I think we ought to go behind the scenes of this new housewife's boon and see how it's made, don't you? They make these cracker fingers at a factory at Cinderford, and they make them by the million. The flour is sifted through an overhead shaker into tubs, which already contain the other ingredients. Having made sure that the right proportions of the ingredients needed for this biscuit are in the tub, it's wheeled under a machine. A button is pressed, and huge mixing blades descend and start churning it. Everything is automatically controlled, even the time that the ingredients have to be mixed. That lot is mixed now, the mixing blades, their work finished, rise up. Now the tray is wheeled away to a dark room so that the mixture can ferment for 24 hours. The prepared dough now starts on its processes of shaping and cooking. First, the mixture comes down the chute. It goes to large rollers which pick it up and turn it into yards and yards of flat, smooth dough. There'll be quite a few biscuits to be made from that lot, and it's going on continually all the time. The dough arrives at the cutting machine, and when it comes out the other side, there are hundreds of potential biscuits in place of the continuous strips of dough. The shapes go under an electromagnet. That's to make sure that nothing, not even a pin, has got through in the original flour. Now they go into the oven. These ovens are nearly a hundred yards long. They bristle with gas jets. 
From the view posts in the side of the oven, the operator can tell at a glance how the baking is going on. If necessary, more heat can be added by lighting a few more of the gas jets. Easy control of temperature is the secret of mass cooking. The cooked biscuits go to the packing room. Here, the biscuits move along conveyors. They go past checkers to a machine. This wraps them in cellophane, and here's your biscuit, packed and ready to send out to you. Yes, all that goes on behind the scenes of a simple biscuit. Now, after all that food, what about a little exercise? We're going behind the scenes at the Streatham Ice Rink, where some 20,000 people come every week to skate. Some are good, very good. This is Carol Potter, 14 years old and already in the championship class. Who knows, one day she may become as famous as Sonia Haney. And here's someone learning. Ten-year-old Johnny Hill. This is Johnny's first time at... Whoops! <laughs> well, Johnny, you have 17,000 square feet of ice on which to fall and learn to skate. And 17,000 square feet is quite a lot of ice to keep in good condition under the constant pounding of 20,000 pairs of skates a week. Here's Mr. Dennison to tell us how it's done. He's been engineer in charge since the Streatham Ice Rink was built in the early 30s. He told us that the day starts early at Streatham. Strangely enough, the ice, far from being worn away by the skates, tends to build up. And every morning around 6 o'clock, attendants are busy planing off the excess ice with this motorized scraper. The cutter not only keeps the ice at the ideal depth of one and a half inches, but also removes the rough patches caused by the previous day's skating. All this vast area of ice is made by 10 miles of four inch pipes laid underneath. Freezing starts with this pump. It compresses the 5,000 pounds of ammonia, a gas byproduct, by the way, which in a closed circuit becomes the cooling fluid. The compressed ammonia is pumped into the freezing room. In here, Great Scott, chickens? What's gone wrong? Mr. Dennison? Mr. Dennison! What? What? Oh, I see. Sorry about that. Apparently it's quite right. The ice rink staff are allowed to use the freezing room as a personal refrigerator. Not a bad idea. Well, to get on, liquid ammonia expands in this cylinder. This makes it cold. It cools brine down to 18 degrees below the freezing point of water. The cold brine goes through these pipes to the rink. Well, we left the freezing room. I said we left the freezing room. Hey, leave that hair alone. That's better. We left the freezing room to go back to the rink. Many thanks, Mr. Dennison. Well, that's what goes on behind your skating. Ah, here's Johnny again. Whoops. <laughs> Johnny certainly brought this edition of Behind the Scenes to an end with a bang. Well, we've been behind the scenes in a number of places. By the way, did you notice how often gas or its byproduct turned up? Amazing, isn't it? Well, that's all for this time. Goodbye now.